Hello again. It's good to be back with you, as always. Um, we've been doing a, a couple of videos on thermodynamics, and I'd like to keep that up. Today I want to talk about a really basic idea called specific heat. Now, specific heat is a material property, and it's very, very important when we're studying any kind of system where we're using changes in temperature to do work. So if you're using uh, heat in an engine to do work, if you're using uh, doing work with an air conditioner to move heat from one place to another, you're going to care about specific heat, and I'll tell you why here in a second. Okay, so the good news is the fundamental concept is pretty simple. Um, information on specific heats are everywhere on the internet. That's where I got the information or the numbers I'm going to show you. And the other is very easy to describe. So here's the, I'm going to give you the, the definition first. Specific heat is the amount of energy it takes to raise one kilogram of a material by one degree C. Okay, I'll even write it down here so you can do a screenshot if you want. Energy to raise one kilogram, it's kind of a funny one, by one degree C. All right. Now, there, you'll see, when, you, when you look on the internet, you're going to see these charts and they're going to be in different units. Unfortunately, there's still some uh, uh, charts done in English units and they're in, I don't know, slugs per cubic fathom or something. I don't know what they are. But um, I'm going to deal specifically in uh, metric units, SI units, as, as God intended. Um, so we're trying to raise one kilogram of a material by one degree C. Sometimes you'll, you'll see these uh, written as one gram of material, one degree C. Okay, well kilogram is the fundamental unit in the SI system, last I checked. Um, a newton is a, is a kilogram meter per second squared, so kilogram is the, is the uh, fundamental unit. So all the numbers I've, I'm going to show you are in kilograms uh, per, per kilogram. Um, if you want to work in per gram, they're just off by a factor of a thousand. A thousand grams in a kilogram. So every material has this number called uh, specific heat and when you're moving energy from one place to another in a system by heating something, well how much energy can you move? Depends on the specific heat. So let's say that um, I'm trying to cool the engine on my car. Well there's heat inside the engine. I want most of it there, well I want a lot of it there because I want that heat to make power that will move my car down the road. But I can't have too much because the engine is made out of mostly aluminum, uh, some steel. If it gets too hot, those parts break. I can burn holes in the pistons, I can break things. So I have to cool it. Well, the people who designed it have to cool it, I just drive it. But um, it has to be cooled somehow. Well, there's a radiator on the front and there's a fluid that goes around the engine that's about half ethylene glycol and about half water. It gets heated up by the engine block, goes around through the radiator, and cools off again. I can even draw a picture. Um, and I'm going to draw this as an actual <laughs> picture that an engineer would understand. I'm not going to try to draw a, like a Carnot diagram or something. So there's the engine, there's the transmission spinning, and there's a radiator up here. Okay, so there's the engine, there's the radiator. Okay, so heat goes from the engine to the radiator, gets cooled off, okay, that's the whole idea of the radiator, it has all those fins in it, rejects heat to the atmosphere, and come, the, the uh, fluid comes back to the engine cold so it can pick up more heat and go again. Well, why do we use ethylene glycol in water? Why don't we use something else? Well, it turns out that water has about the highest specific heat of any liquid you'd ever want to get near. Um, the only problem with it is it boils at 100 C and it freezes at zero. Well, where I live, it gets colder than zero C quite a lot in the winter. So if you put some ethylene glycol in it, that changes the freezing point so that it won't freeze during the winter and crack the block. And during the summer, it's pretty easy here to, to get uh, the engine above 100 C. That's no problem at all. And I, don't, I can't have water boiling in the lines. Okay? I want it to be liquid at high temperature and still liquid at low temperature. That's where the ethylene glycol comes in. So you mix them together and you've got a fluid now that, that is liquid at a usable temperature range and still has a pretty high uh, specific heat. Right? That's, that's why the engines are built like they do and cooled like they are. Now there's one thing about specific heat you need to understand and that's that it's not the numbers 
are not intuitive. You cannot look at a material and guess its specific heat. Okay? So I've got, where's my bottle of water? I've got, well, I had, a, I had a full bottle of water here. My daughter was using it to make tea. So here's, what's that, about a liter and a half, two liters, I suppose, left of distilled water, okay? This has a, speci a certain specific heat. I'll tell you in a minute what it is. This is a book, okay? I wrote this book, okay, there it is, just so you can see. Um, what's the, this is a material. It has a specific heat. Well, which one has the higher specific heat? The water? Or the book. Well, turns out the water has a higher specific heat. This is a piece of aluminum I was using for a project, so I've got it sitting here in my office. This is just plain old, I don't know, a 60 to 61 T6 aluminum probably. Okay, this has a specific heat. Well, which has a higher specific heat? This or that? Which do you think? Okay, well, it turns out this has a lot higher specific heat than this does. It's harder to heat this. This can absorb more energy per degree per unit temperature than this can. Okay, would you have guessed that? I don't know, I wouldn't have. I would, when I looked these numbers up, I was constantly looking going, that can't be right going and checking other sources. These numbers are right, as far as I can tell. They, they, they match up from a number of various sources across the web and in textbooks. So the numbers I'm going to write on the board, I think, are correct. Now, as some of you have known, noticed uh, before when I've been uh, doing these uh, talks, it takes a long time to write stuff on the board. I have a whiteboard elf named Spike. Spike takes care of these things for me, so we don't have to wait. Okay, well, yeah, it looks like Spike was here again. That's good. All right, so here's some numbers. Well, if I want to cool, well, let me back up a second. Why do I care about these numbers? Because if we're pushing heat around a system, that means we're pushing energy around a system. I don't know about you, I don't have an energy meter. There's no device I can stick into a fluid and say, oh, it's got a certain amount of energy. I can't measure that directly. What I can measure is temperature. And if I know what the temperature is, then I can figure out the energy. So that's why you want to know this, all right? I've got a thermometer. I can stick a thermometer in my uh, radiator, only while it's cool. Safety first, guys. Um, I can put it in that bottle of water over there. I can measure the temperature of the book sitting over here. From there, I can figure out how much energy has been uh, transferred into those those objects, okay? I only know how to measure temperature, so I need this if I'm going to figure out what the heat is. Without these numbers, I don't know what the heat is anymore, okay? So, hydrogen. Would you guess that hydrogen is like three times uh, a little more than water? Why don't we just use hydrogen for everything? It's easy to make. You just stick two leads in a bucket of salt water. You can have all the hydrogen you want. Well, it's a gas. It's an explosive gas. Um, its density is very, very low unless you turn it into a liquid. And I would not necessarily mind being near a bunch of gaseous hydrogen. I would very much mind being near a bunch of liquid hydrogen, okay? I, I don't want to be there. That's a bad place to be. Well, helium is, doesn't explode. It's, it's, it's uh, chemically inert. You can't get it to explode. It just sits there. Well, it's intensely expensive because it comes out of natural gas wells. Uh, there's a terrible shortage of it, and it's a very light gas. You can't get enough of this into your engine to cool it, okay? Unless you turn it into a liquid. But if you're going to turn it into a liquid, it has to be like a couple of Kelvin. Getting helium to liquefy is incredibly expensive, okay? So these are just non starters. Here you go water. Water's everywhere, okay? It just runs out of the faucet around here, okay? And it's the, the specific heat's pretty high. If you want to store energy, you can heat water, okay? You don't even have to boil it. You just can just heat it. Get it to 99C. It takes a lot of energy to raise uh, a kilogram of water one degree C. Oh, and by the way, that uh, sometimes you'll see that written as per uh, kilogram degree Kelvin. Or, well, Kelvin. It's not actually degree Kelvin. But deg uh, degree C and Kelvin, if you're, if you're dealing with just changes in temperature, those are equivalent. Okay, we're not dealing with absolute temperatures here. Um, antifreeze. 
Well, like we talked about that. Well, a 50-50 mixture of antifreeze, which means half water, half ethylene glycol, still pretty good. And it has, it's a liquid in a much larger range, so that's good. Ethanol would work. You could actually cool your engine with ethanol. But the problem is it has about a third less uh, uh, specific heat than antifreeze does. Well, if the game I'm playing is that I want to uh, transfer as much heat as I can by you know, uh, heating up the antifreeze, this is a better bet than this is. This, is, this burns, too. This doesn't burn. It's poisonous, but it doesn't burn. Um, cork, how about that one? Did you expect that one? I didn't. I, I saw it on the chart and I went, that, that's crazy. That can't be right. Leather? That means this has more specific heat. Where did I put my book? I put it up there. Oh, and it's right here. That means this has a higher specific heat than this. Huh. Wouldn't have guessed. Okay. And again, gang, the whole point is that you have, you have to look these numbers up. You cannot guess them. These are beyond your intuition boundary. You can't look at some new material and go, eh, 2300. Well, I can't. I, I don't know anybody who can. You, this is uh, something you have to look up on your own. Air has a pretty high specific heat. And a cubic meter of air, which is about a cube about that big, has a mass of about 1.2 or so. Uh, kilograms, so you can actually use air to cool things, right? That's why radiators work. That's why air conditioners work. That's why blowing a fan over something on a hot day works, okay? Aluminum has a surprisingly low specific heat, and it's still twice the specific heat of steel. Would you have guessed that steel has about the lowest specific heat of any material you're likely to come across? Turns out platinum has a lower specific heat than that, but I don't know about you, I don't have blocks of platinum laying around my office. So here you go. This is what these numbers look like. And uh, before I leave you here, remember, the, it feels weird to walk around with one shoe on, you know what? Um, the reason we care about this is because we want to be able to track energy as it moves through a system. Well, we don't have energy meters. We have thermometers. So because we can't track energy directly, we track temperature. Okay? And energy and heat are the same thing. So we're tracking temperature and we're calculating energy or heat from that temperature and we're doing it because of this number right here. So anyway, hope this helps and I'll see you next time.